Università di Oxford, di cui è attualmente professore emerito. È autore di bestseller come Il Gene Egoista, Il Fenotipo Esteso, L'Orgiaio Cieco, Alla Conquista del Monte Improbabile e tra i più recenti La Realtà è Magica. E i due volumi della sua autobiografia, Un Appetit for Wonder, The Making of a Scientist and a Brief Candle in the Dark, My Life in Sciences, eh, probabilmente sono eh, in corso di pubblicazione anche in italiano. Nel 2010 ha fondato la Richard Dawkins Foundation for Research and Science, che ha sede a Washington, vive a Oxford. A questo punto eh, non mi rimane che dare la parola al professor Dawkins, eh, che farà una breve prolusione di introduzione eh, sulla mostra di Jonathan King. We carry within us the wonders we seek without us. There is all Africa and her prodigies in us. I quoted those lines from Sir Thomas Brown, the 17th century English writer, at the beginning of my review of Jonathan Kingdon's book, The Self-Made Man, and I went on. A gentle wisdom comes out of Africa, a timeless vision that looks through and beyond the effete faddishness, the forgettable ephemerality of contemporary culture and preoccupation. With the eyes of an artist and the mind of a scientist and polymath, Jonathan Kingdon gazes deep into the past, and if you look deeply enough into our human past, you come inevitably to the home continent of Africa. He was born there, and so as it happens was I. That island Africa was the motherland of a priceless collection of anciently African mammals, the Afrotheria, which includes elephants and hyraxes, dugongs, aardvarks, tenrecs, elephant shrews. Immigrants to Africa from Asia <coughs> include ancestors which subsequently evolved into a gloriously rich supplementary African fauna, including lions, leopards and other carnivores such as hyenas, the magnificent diversity of antelopes from the tiny diptych to the majestic eland, zebras, hippos, giraffes, rodents ranging from porcupines and spring hares to the termite-like naked mole rats. As Jonathan himself has said, the diversity of Africa's mammals is unrivaled in the world, and nobody in the world knows them better than Jonathan himself. His eyes are the eyes of a scientist. He sees through the skin to the underlying anatomy, as Leonardo da Vinci did. But he also sees through the present to the evolutionary past, as Leonardo living before Darwin could not. One could almost say he is a Leonardo for the post-Darwinian age. And Jonathan sees his animals in their proper place in the ecology and the geography of Africa, that gigantic island with its partially isolated faunistic island here in Trento, and it's surely the finest museum of its kind in all Italy, to put on this exhibition, and I congratulate them. It's divided into three sections. First, what it is to be a mammal. Second, and this one is dearest to my heart, I suppose, science as inspiration. And third, in the eye of the beholder. The first two will speak for themselves, or rather the art will speak for itself. I can perhaps add a little on the third topic, which is all about visual signals in nature. Most of nature's vivid colours, and they really are vivid, have been naturally selected to be the way they are by the eyes of animals. Jonathan describes them as packages of information signals designed by natural selection to fit pre-structured templates. And those templates, of course, are the sense organs and perceptual mechanisms of animals, often of the same species, mates or rivals, but also of other species, predators, prey, pollinators in the case of flowers. It's appropriate if I, if I quote now the poet Keats's Ode to a Nightingale. Of him, my heart aches, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and Lethe Woods had sung. Keats was a human poet, not a nightingale, but his brain was a vertebrate brain like a nightingale's, and he was drugged by the nightingale's song. Is it fanciful to suggest that a female nightingale might be similarly intoxicated by a male song, but more powerfully because the song was composed by natural selection to fit the template of female nightingale's aesthetic taste? What this is leading me to, using Jonathan's own words, as well as mine, is that we might be mistaken to emphasize information as the word for 
that which is conveyed by animal signals. Words like intoxication, manipulation, visual drug, control by the sender of the signal, of the receiver of the signal, might be more appropriate. Information suggests that the signal is informing the receiver of something useful to the receiver, and the implication is that both sender and receiver benefit. That was indeed the implication of the earlier literature on animal signals, the literature that I was brought up on in the Tinbergen School of Ethologists. Thank you very much. I have a great many uh, thanks to give, and I think we would waste a great deal of time if I tried to list them all. We have in the exhibition, uh, in the preamble to the uh, exhibition, there are long lists of all the people who have contributed. And all I can say is a, a huge heartfelt thank you to all the people in this museum, which is a magnificent museum, uh, a real trailblazer, in my opinion, uh, in science museums globally. And if we look forward to two or three generations from now, I think science museums are one of the few really optimistic things about the world we live in today. <laughs> so I'm very thankful to all of you uh, in Muse, first and foremost. And, and we both have very many things in common. And one of the wonderful things about old friends is you don't have to explain so many things which you have to explain to people who don't know very well. And so I always feel at ease with Richard because we share a great deal in common in our enthusiasms, in our background, the sort of parents we had, and the experiences we've had of life. And we are of the same generation. That is also a bit of a bond. Um, so anyway, a very big thank you to everybody at Muse and to Richard and of course sentimentalized or even mild eroticism. Having milky mothers defines us. It defines us as people, but it also defines us as primates and as mammals. <coughs> and this exhibition is partly an affirmation of a shared ancestry with other mammals. Now a personal note. My own mother taught me to draw and to paint before she taught me to read and to write. And that was significant because my mother, Dorothy, was a professional artist and art teacher, defining herself as a maker of images, a natural inheritance for me. To a greater or lesser extent, my mother defined me genetically, culturally, and professionally about the powerful illusion and design of life and of course that includes human humanity. This amazingly simple idea can explain all this complexity, all this beauty, all this, all this elegance. It seems to me tragic that anybody should go to their grave without appreciating this, this wonderful idea. So I totally agree it should be taught at the, at the primary school level, and it should dominate education in, in, in biology, as many people have said. I actually would like to see, not just taught at primary school level, but I could imagine an entire university course being based upon evolution, which would embrace not just biology, but geology and physics and anthropology, art history, linguistics, an enormous number of different educational disciplines can be united under this one umbrella of, of evolution. Uh, is, it is embedded, the perception of beauty is embedded in the nervous system, in the brain of the beholder. That in itself evolves. And this has been worked out in the theory of sexual selection, where very extravagant sexual advertisements, often by males towards females, have become built up over the generations 
as the male ornament increases in size or in brightness or whatever it is, it, it, that, that happens in parallel with the evolution of the female perceptual apparatus. Both of them are advancing, uh, as Fisher said, R.A. Fisher said, at ever increasing speed in some cases. Um, so uh, it's not a static thing. The perceptual apparatus is evolving uh, in parallel with the evolution of the uh, aesthetically pleasing advertisement in itself. And I think that there may be a cultural analogue of that in, in humans, because of course the, the art that appeals to humans evolves in cultural evolution. The, 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 um, the, the artistic standards, the artistic values of say 20th or 21st century art are very different from those of medieval art. The aesthetics of this, almost of the society evolve in such a way that that which is pleasing to us today may, might not have been pleasing to our ancestors 500 years ago and um, that, that in itself evolves, but in this case not by biological evolution, by cultural evolution.